Good morning, good afternoon, and for some of you, good evening. And welcome to the first to the series of AGI webinars for 2021. My name is Eric Lynch, and I'm the CEO of the Asian Golf Industry Federation, and I'll be your host and facilitator for today's webinar. By way of background, the AGI have launched this series of webinars in late 2020 and ran 10 online seminars in the latter part of last year. The feedback and participation from the global industry was fantastic and gratifying to receive. And as such, webinars will now become the mainstay of our activities uh, and now and in post COVID period. Most every week on Thursdays, we'll continue to deliver webinars on turf and club management issues with industry leaders to supply career building information <coughs> to professionals in Asia and the rest of the world. We have a great lineup of speakers generously willing to share their time and expertise with us. A bit about the AGIF, the Asian Golf Industry Federation is a not-for-profit federation, membership federation comprised of suppliers and facilities in the turf, club, and sports industry. The federation focuses on building sustainable practices, both in the environmental and economic aspects throughout the Asia Pacific region. We believe that key in the development of a sustainable industry is the education and empowerment of professionals in the industry, hence events like today. We developed the AGIF Certificate in Greenskeeping, which is supported by DRNA and five AGIF member organizations. The CIG focuses on development, the skill of, of greenskeepers and turf professionals throughout Asia. We also focus on club management education and our partners with the Club Management Association of America. And we rolled out their education in Asia for the pathway to the certified club manager degree. The CCM is considered the gold standard in club management in the industry globally, and managers in Asia can now achieve the necessary education here in Asia as a result of this partnership with the CMAA. It is vital to have strong partners in implementing education throughout Asia, and our education is recognized for credits by the PGA of America, the PGA of GBR in Ireland, the PGA of Australia, the PGA of Japan, the Club Management Association of America, and the GCSAA. Due to the travel restrictions from the COVID-19 pandemic, webinars are the only way we can continue to deliver education uh, at the moment. We'll resume event education when travel restrictions ease and we'll continue to keep you posted as this develops. Over the last few months, we've spent a lot of time improving our digital offering and membership benefits. For more information, please log on to www.agif.asia as well as our LinkedIn and Facebook company pages. Please also sign up for our weekly newsletter to join the 10,000 plus industry contacts to receive a weekly industry update. The AGIF is a non-for-profit federation and now more than ever, we rely upon membership dues to operate. So if you like what we do and or you think your facility or company will benefit from communicating with the industry, please note that our membership benefits are substantial and can be seen under at the website under AGIF membership benefits. Please take a look. And if you're already an AGIF member, thank you. Your ongoing support is greatly appreciated. And speaking of member support, we'd like to thank the sponsors of today's webinars, Sustain Natural Fertilizers and the Toro Company. Without their support, we would not be able to run events like this. So we thank them for their patronage. On to some housekeeping issues. Our speaker today, Kevin Kenworthy, will present roughly 50 to 60 minutes, and we'll have a 30 minute Q&A after that. The chat and Q&A buttons are on throughout, so please feel free to ask questions, which we can then voice to Ken during the Q&A session. Now on to the main event. <clears throat> I would like to welcome Dr. Kevin Kenworthy to the AGI Sustainability Series. Dr. Kenworthy is a professor of turf grass breeding and genetics at the University of Florida, the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, where he has held faculty positions since 2004 in the agronomy department. As the lead investigator in turf grass cultivar de development at the University of Florida, he has developed a collaborative approach that integrates faculties across IFAS departments and partners with Florida's sod industry. He teaches a grad graduate course in plant breeding techniques. Today, Dr. Kenworthy will be sharing information regarding the improvement of zoysia grass and Bermuda grass uh, for use on golf courses. Data will be presented regarding recent releases on, an event, on advanced experimental lines. Kevin, welcome. Eric, thank you for that uh, introduction. And uh, thank you, AGIF, for the opportunity to speak with you today. This is quite an honor for me. And, and uh, <clears throat> what a great result of the situation we're in that, that easily allows me to share some information from my breeding program 
uh, with uh, quite a wide and, and diverse audience. So uh, it's truly my honor to be here and uh, particularly uh, to speak to so many people who work and live in the regions of the world where zoysia grass is native. And, uh, you know, I've been a big fan of zoysia grass for many years and, and there's, I'm, I'm sure I could learn far more from many attending this presentation than uh, what I'll be able to deliver in terms of, of education. It, it'd be wonderful one day to, to visit some of these regions and uh, see some firsthand accounts. Um, but today, <clears throat> I will share some information on uh, my breeding program. And uh, let's see. Ooh. There we go. Um, <clears throat> I thought I would start off by just providing a little bit of background on uh, my location and where I'm at so that you can have some sort of reference. I uh, know that uh, many out there know where the state of Florida is, but you may, may not understand where the University of Florida main campus is. And uh, it's in this area of the state here that we refer to as North Central Florida. You can see uh, uh, with respect to Orlando, where Disney World is, and of course Miami, down in the southern part of the state. Uh, the weather patterns and uh, the climate of the region where I am up here is far different than what the southern part of the Florida Peninsula experiences. I have a, a, a somewhat of a winter, whereas as you get below that Tampa Orlando line and move further south in the state, there are many areas of the state that have a little to no winter at all. It's truly a tropical environment as you get down into the very southern part of the state. Um, so that allows me to expose and screen things in a lot of in some very uh, diverse environments that could have wide adaptability around the world. The picture on the right is an aerial view of our turf grass research field facility, which is uh, we affectionately refer to as Citra. And that's because it's located in the very tiny town of Citra, about 30 miles south of Gainesville. This uh, wonderful facility, um, since we're located in the central part of the state, we have a very deep sandy soil. And so even though we're in a high rainfall area, uh, drought symptoms can show up very quickly in this region of the state, uh, particularly during the, the summer when we have uh, high temperatures. If we don't get rain for five or seven days, then we can have some drought symptoms show up depending on the species. Uh, but we do get uh, a lot of rainfall. We'll talk about some of uh, that here as we go forward. So a little more on our climate. Um, in general, I would say that we have a hot, humid climate, uh, not too unlike uh, the climate of Southeast Asia. We definitely have a colder winter than what is experienced by many of the regions uh, where AGIF, AGIF represents. But I would say that we have some similarities, particularly our summer being hot and humid. And if you look on this map here that shows rainfall patterns and ET rates, there are many months, particularly uh, if we, we look at uh, June, uh, July, August, and September, where rainfall exceeds evapotranspiration. So we have a lot of rainfall, high amounts of rainfall during the summer even though that is the hotter period of the year, we don't really need to water that much during this period of the year. Um, during the tail end parts of the year, that's when we are a little bit drier and uh, even, but it is cooler. So we don't have to water a whole lot because of those cooler periods of the year. Now that changes in South Florida where it's warmer uh, in those tail end parts of the year in the, in the spring and fall. And so they would have to water more than what I need to in my location. Uh, so I do have a mild winter <clears throat> and we have that rainy season during the warmest months and that provides significant cloud cover, which then limits photosynthesis. So I'm trying to equate the environment where this breeding program is located to what much of the region in Southeast Asia experiences. 
<clears throat> and we'll also do this uh, using the uh, daily light integral and uh, DLI is the number of photosynthetically active photons accumulated through a day. Okay, so what does that mean? In simplistic terms, it basically means how much light is available for active photosynthesis. So I mentioned that rainy period in the summer, we have a lot of cloud cover and we don't have a lot of sunlight. And if you then have a, a shady areas on your course or in home lawns, then there's not a lot of light available for the growth of turf grass. And so I've got uh, three locations here where I developed these uh, DLI curves and I used uh, this calculator that's available at the uh, Asian Turfgrass uh, Center. And uh, it's pretty handy to do this. And so if we look at my location here, which is Citra, Florida, and this, uh, when you plug into the calculator, it gives you the past year's worth of uh, daily light integral, the amount of light that's available for photosynthesis, so to speak. And so we have uh, May of 2020 through March of 2021 here, and this is the same for all three of these graphs. But if you look at this, uh, kind of this uh, 40 is a benchmark for being able to really provide good growth of Bermuda grass, and you see that for much of the year, I don't have a DLI that's very high in my location. And in fact, it compares very favorably to this. This is a random location that I picked in Thailand to uh, somewhat represent many areas of the AGIF so that I could show some of the similar challenges that we have with DLI. Um, so there's not a lot of light available in this region of the world. And so Bermuda grass can be a challenge. And so you see a lot of zoysia grass grown in this particular climate. And so compare this with uh, uh, Texas. And I'll just uh, say that I know that many of the, and this is in San Antonio, Texas, and many of the recent new zoysia grass cultivars moving into Asia have been developed in Texas. Well, if we look at this, they have a larger portion of the year where they have uh, very high amounts of DLI. And again, this is in the warmer period of the year. And so they have far less rainfall than I have um, and, and a lot more light available. So I'm trying to make the point that this breeding program's location is gonna have a climate more similar to develop products that are gonna better meet the needs for turf management in Southeast Asia. <clears throat> so the first thing we're gonna look at is Bermuda grass. And when we go into these two species, we're gonna talk about Bermuda grass and zoysia grass. Well, I'll talk just briefly on kind of the existing market before we talk about the, the breeding program. So of course, with Bermuda grass, uh, Tifway 419 was released in 1960 and is still the basis of the Bermuda grass industry worldwide. Things are beginning to change now, particularly in the United States with, the, with uh, many new cultivars on the market. In the late 90s, Tiff Sport became available, didn't have a long lifespan. In the early 2000s, Celebration, which has, uh, has an established foothold in the United States, Patriot didn't do a whole lot, and Premier Pro hasn't done a whole lot. In the late 2000s, Tiff Grand came on board, um, hasn't done a whole lot in the U.S. And then in the last five years, really many, many new cultivars have come onto the Bermuda grass market and really changed the market. And uh, products such as Northbridge, Latitude 36 from Oklahoma State, Tiff Tough Bermuda grass from the famous program in Tifton, Georgia, uh, has, is really doing quite well, uh, produced on thousands of acres now in the United States. Bimini may be one that you're not familiar with in your regions, but it's kind of a, has been uh, locally brought to the market in Florida and is doing quite well in South Florida. The Homa 31, the most recent release from the Oklahoma State program. And then uh, two additional cultivars that you may not uh, have heard of, Land Run, an iron cutter, also developed in Oklahoma, but by a private company in a very dry part of the state. Uh, but those uh, grasses have done well in some regional testing, such as the INTEP program. 
And then if you look at seeded cultivars, uh, I've got a few listed there, but there are really too many to mention. I actually looked at a trial today of some seeded Bermuda grasses, and you can see some slight differences in color, but for the most part, many of them look fairly similar, at least they do in, in our environment. And overall, their quality still doesn't match those of the vegetative Bermuda grass cultivars here on the left. So a little bit more. It's important to know uh, what we mean by hybrid Bermuda grass. So I would say the term hybrid Bermuda grass used to have a very uh, specific meaning, uh, but that term kind of got butchered in the last 10 years with the development of celebration Bermuda grass. So uh, we've now kind of fine tuned our definitions of hybrid Bermuda grass. Dr. Wayne Hanna uh, from the Tifton, Georgia program uh, wrote this article in Golf Course Management Magazine to help redefine the terms for hybrid Bermuda grass. And so a hybrid, when you're a plant breeder, the term hybrid simply means that you've crossed parents that differed for the trait of interest. And so while we had a more specific use of the term hybrid in Bermuda grass pre previously, to say that celebration is a hybrid Bermuda grass is perfectly acceptable and scientifically correct. You're taking two different common Bermuda grasses, Cynodon dactylons, crossing those to produce a hybrid that has a combination of new traits. And so celebration is a hybrid Bermuda grass, uh, of, is a hybrid of two common Bermuda grasses, Bimini as well, a hybrid of two common Bermuda grasses, and all of the seeded Bermuda grasses on the market are common Bermuda grasses as well. So kind of the new twist in the use of hybrid Bermuda grass terminology to refer to the majority of those on the market we like to encourage people now to use this, this specific term, triploid interspecific hybrid Bermuda grass to refer to things like Tifway 419 or Tif Tough or Tahoma 31 or Latitude 36. And so most of the high quality interspecific hybrids in Bermuda grass are a cross between two distinct species. When we use the term Interspecific, that means we're crossing plants that are different species. They're related, they're the same genus, Cynodon, but they are different species. One of these being Cynodon transvalensis and the other being Cynodon dactylon. <clears throat> we uh, use the loose term of African Bermuda grass for Cynodon transvalensis and, of course, common Bermuda grass for Cynodon dactylon. And when we make a hybrid, when we produce a seedling between these two species, we now refer to this as a triploid interspecific hybrid Bermuda grass. And so what do we mean by triploid? Well, the uh, uh, Bermuda grasses have nine different chromosomes. And you'll see here that for transvalensis, there are 18 uh, chromosomes. There are two sets of nine. Okay, and for common Bermuda grass, you see 36. There are four sets of nine. So if we cross a plant that has two sets and a plant that has four sets, that means we end up with a hybrid with three sets of chromosomes. Three sets of nine gives us a total of 27 chromosomes. This is an odd number. It can't divide evenly. So these triploid interspecific hybrid Bermuda grasses tend to be sterile. Whereas the hybrid Bermuda grasses, Celebration and Bimini, they are fertile plants. But everything over here is considered a sterile plant. So it should remain very uniform for a long period of time. Uh, contamination can occur and does occur in sod production fields and on golf courses, but uh, your best bet for a uniform surface is to go with a vegetative interspecific hybrid Bermuda grass, such as one of these listed here. Okay, so how do we breed these interspecific hybrid Bermuda grasses? This is, a, this is actually a pretty simple uh, process. We're shown here these are different, these wider strips here are strips of African Bermuda grass. This is at my research farm. Because African Bermuda grass is not as aggressive, I established these African strips sooner and let them get well established. And then we'll plug in here 
the different plants of common Bermuda grass. And then we let these flower on their own and we go through and harvest the seed. And we'll get out of this, we'll get crosses that are common Bermuda grass, we'll get crosses that are African Bermuda grass, and we'll get crosses occur that, re that produce the triploid interspecific hybrids as well. So this is a means of not only progressing the breeding program, but also producing those hybrids that are then going to go through many years of evaluation before they might make it into the market. <clears throat> and so let's get into uh, some of the information, look at some of the uh, new uh, experimental lines that are coming up in the program. And the trial that I'm going to share with you here is funded by the Florida Golf Course Superintendents Association. It's been, uh, this trial has been established at three sites in Florida, Citra being my location, Davie, Florida being in South uh, Florida near Miami, and Jay, Florida being up in the Western Panhandle of Florida. So these are very drastic environments through the state of Florida. And if you were to drive from Jay to Davie, you would spend about, uh, 10 to 11 hours in the car. So Florida is not one of the biggest states in the U.S., but in terms of length, it's a long ways from one tip to the other. Mowing heights here for this trial are about 13 millimeters, so it is a fairway trial. And so here's some data. This trial was planted in 2019 from plugs and then allowed to grow in. And so what you're looking here is at a, a graph of turf grass quality from both summer and winter of the summer of 2020 and then this last winter from 20 to 21. And you're shown the data in turf grass quality here on the Y axis. We rate for this using a one to nine scale as defined by the National, National Turf Grass Evaluation Program where nine would be a perfect plot and one would be a dead plot. And six is generally considered acceptable, but you see that many of uh, the TQ turf quality values are below six. And that's because these are an average across uh, many months where we may have had disease or other issues come into the plots. We don't apply any fungicide. We don't apply any insecticide. We leave these things to their own uh, genetic effects and determine which of those have the strongest genetic components in their background to persist through the many stress factors that occur in our environment. <clears throat> and so you see here that there are several different commercial cultivars, Tiff Tough, Iron Cutter, Latitude 36, Celebration, Land Run, Tahoma 31, Northbridge, Bimini, uh, and oh, forgot uh, Tiffway 419 as well. So several commercial cultivars to look at in comparison, everything else is an experimental, pro, uh, experimental Bermuda grass. And you see that we've got a few things, FB 1630 that is performing uh, very well in this trial. Uh, another of those is FB 1628, uh, 34334 and this 41-2 are all competing very well with the best of the commercial cultivars. And then also uh, very much, very important in the state of Florida is how things perform in our winter. Um, depending on your location within the AGIF uh, regions, then the winters may be more important or less important, uh, but certainly the, the, the performance during the summer would be across the board important for everyone. Uh, we need grasses that hold their color and actually grow. Most of the golf in the state of Florida is played during the winter months. So we need a grass that, that not only holds color, but maintains density and some resiliency to traffic during the winter. So we, I often separate out performance between the summer months and the winter months. But you do see that we have a few things in the program competing nicely with many, with the best of the commercial cultivars. So here's another graph, uh, same setup, uh, one to nine scale, but the, in this case, we're looking at two different diseases that have, uh, we have identified on the plots. In uh, 2020, we had bipolaris occurring, uh, actually fairly prevalent through many months of the trial. And then April, 
of uh, 2020, we had dollar spot occurring in the trial. We haven't had disease in the Bermuda grass trial uh, this year. So both of these data points are from last year. And this is also visually rated using that one to nine scale. Nine means no disease. So as you're looking at graphs today in this presentation, just remember that the high bars mean good performance and the low bars mean bad performance. And so nine would mean no disease symptoms for bipolaris or dollar spot. And one would be, mean that the plant died from bipolaris or dollar spot. <clears throat> and the figure is sorted from left to right based on the bipolaris uh, rankings. And so we have, uh, you see them amongst the commercial cultivars, tipped up celebration and Tahoma 31 have performed uh, very well for bipolaris and also uh, pretty good for dollar spot, although we've got several other uh, grasses that have done a little better than celebration and Tahoma for the dollar spot. But along with these commercial cultivars, there are again, the same group of, of experimental lines that are performing well and comparable to the best commercial cultivars. So we've got some of these that are a little bit better than Tiff Tough for Bipolaris and equal for Dollar Spot and uh, then better than any of the other commercial cultivars for Bipolaris. So we're making some good progress in the breeding program here at the University of Florida in the Bermuda grass program. I'm not sure when we might release something. We want to do some more testing. We need to work with sod producers in our region to see how these produce. Uh, there's a lot that goes into the development and release of a cultivar. It's not just small plot evaluations, but we've got to work with growers, put some We'll, we'll work with golf course superintendents as well to put some out on golf courses and get some real world situations before we make decisions on release. We've also done some traffic work and uh, we've utilized uh, this system. This is called a Baldry traffic simulator and this uh, modified traffic simulator, it's a modification of an airification machine and this particular machine was built at the University of Georgia at the Tifton program. And we've built a similar machine to this to utilize in our uh, traffic simulation. And so this shows percent green cover through the fall and getting into the winter in my location in Florida. The, the dates for rating are October, November, another one in November, and then in December. And notice that this title says that we're looking at percent green cover as affected by traffic and freezing temperatures. We had some significant freezing events uh, prior to this last date of rating where we got down to, oh boy, I'm going to be in Fahrenheit, 26, 27 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, I didn't think about my Celsius conversion uh, before coming on here for that. Um, but we were, we were below freezing for six to eight hours. Uh, we had two freezing events at that level, and uh, that's a big freeze for uh, my area of the state. And it's also important to point out, because as, as you look at these, let's just look at Tiff Tough here. You see that it started out at 100% cover. The wear was imposed. And at this uh, second date, the November 12th, you see that it fell down to below or near 80% cover. And then the wear stopped. And you see on the third date, uh, just about a week later on November 19th, you actually see an increase in percent cover. And you see that for every grass that's included in this chart. And then all of a sudden there's a significant decline in cover for that last rating in December. And that's the effect of the freezing temperatures. And I do wanna point out uh, some of the grasses we've uh, looked at in the previous slide, 1628, 481-2, um, 343-34 was pointed out and also FB 1630. So we've got 1628 that's not nearly as affected by the freezing temperatures, but 1630, if we focus in on this, look how little it was affected by the traffic. It's extremely traffic tolerant, but the freezing temperatures really do 
cause a significant loss of, of greenness. The density stays, but it loses color. It goes brown dormant really quickly. Uh, but in uh, many regions, when South Florida, it won't lose color. And in many regions uh, associated with AGIF, I wouldn't expect a color loss either just due to the, the climatic uh, locations that many of you are from. But anyway, we've got, again, more supportive data that some of these grasses are competing well with the best of the commercial entries. So now we're going to move <clears throat> into the zoysia grass discussion. Of course, zoysia grass is native to Asia. Um, but how long have we had zoysia grass in the United States? Uh, the, the initial introduction or documented introduction was in 1892 with zoysia grass being introduced from Japan. Uh, but into Florida, the initial introductions were in 1902. The most significant introduction occurred in 1912. And if we were all in the same room, I would ask how many people know who C.V. Piper is. Uh, C.V. Piper was uh, a botanist and traveled around the world. And he actually brought a bunch of zoysia grass seed into South Florida that he collected in the Philippines and spread that around through the uh, actually the Caribbean islands and also into South Florida. But C.V. Piper is important because he was the first chairman of the United States Golf Association. And so really a unique individual with a lot of history related to the golf industry and uh, significant in the, in the realm of zoysia grass history as well. There are many cultivars of zoysia grass on the market, and I'm sure there are many more in uh, the regions that many of you are attending from, uh, many more than I even know of, I'm sure. Uh, all of these that are in white shown here are commercially available in the state of Florida. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know about the commercial production of these in your areas and can't really comment much on that except for one of these uh, grass called Tacoa that is recently uh, becoming available in uh, Vietnam. And the reason why I know this is that Tacoa was actually developed at the University of Florida. It was released by my predecessor, so I did not develop Tacoa. Uh, it was released in 2005. It has a very fine texture, fast rate of establishment, very good wear tolerance, and significant shade tolerance. Uh, so this is a new cultivar that will be uh, slowly entering the market in uh, at least Vietnam. So uh, Tacoa zoysia grass. I'm sorry that I don't know anything about the production of other zoysia grasses in the regions. In the states, uh, there are, well, uh, there are uh, 10 or 11 different species of zoysia grass, but in the states, we tend to focus on the three and now a fourth that's been added with a new cultivar that has been introduced from Australia. But most cultivars are zoysia japonica or zoysia matrella. And then with the uh, increased use of some of the putting green cultivars, uh, Zoysia Pacifica, and a lot of these may be hybrids between these species, actually. And as we look at many of the cultivars, at least that I'm familiar with, and some of those may be in Asia, and you can get an idea of how they range based on their leaf texture. So those on the far left are the coarser textured japonica types, and then you progress through the zoysia matrellas and into the zoysia pacificas as we get over to the very fine textures on the far right. So from the far left course to the far right, very fine textures. So you may recognize some of the cultivar names here. Citrozoi is a new cultivar that's been recently commercialized and released from my program here at the University of Florida. It's a hybrid between matrellas uh, zoysia matrella and a zoysia japonica, so it has an intermediate leaf texture between those two species. <clears throat> so in the context of breeding zoysia grass, very different from what we do with Bermuda grass, and you see some uh, seed heads here. We actually make hand crosses, and then we bag those seed heads in the greenhouse. So it's a, it's a manual crossing process with zoysia grass. 
Um, so we will select a female and a male differently. The unique thing about zoysia grass is that it exhibits a, uh, a biological process called protogeny, which means that the female reproductive organs develop on a flower before the male. If we, as we look at a seed head and an individual seed on a seed head, there will be both male and female development within that floret, okay? But protogeny means that the female organs develop first. They, the, uh, you see these feathery stigmas emerging out of the florets, and those are feathery so that they're receptive to pollen grains. And when they're nice and clean and white like this, that means they haven't been pollinated, but they are mature and ready to be pollinated by another flower. This helps to prevent selfing in zoysia grass. Although if you have another flower or seed head that's nearby, pollen from that one can easily cross with, this, with its neighbor seed head. So it's not a very good mechanism for uh, eliminating selfing altogether. But it does mean that we can control the pollination process to some extent. Over here on the right, the male organs are, have extended out of the florets. And this one is at such a level that the pollen is mature. So you can't really see the, the uh, <clears throat> um, uh, the, the male organs very uh, clearly yet. Uh, and so we want to make a cross between these two, right? And so we're gonna do that. And so this shows a close up of the seed head where the uh, um, anthers, anthers was what the term I was looking for. The anthers have matured. They're full of pollen and ready to shed. There, you can actually still see one of the female uh, feathery stigmas here. It's not bright, shiny white. So it has been pollinated before. And here's an example of the anthers here. Um, but this is a, I uh, hope this works. Uh, this is a video and I'm gonna show the pollen release from this and we capture the pollen, not on this video. I'm just showing the actual release of the pollen. So you saw all of that pollen release and quite a bit of it is actually fallen onto this leaf blade and you can visually see that. So we would collect that pollen and then manually transfer it to uh, the plant that we wanna serve as the female and then wait for that seed to mature and collect the seed. And so just as an illustration, again, Citrozoi is a new released product. Uh, it was produced through this conventional crossing process. The two parents are listed here, which won't have any meaning. We had objectives for that program at the time. And when we go through a process of making crosses like this, the goal is to produce two to 3,000 plants. Those, are the, those two to 3,000 plants will then get planted in a big nursery and we'll start this multi-year process where it might take 10 or 12 or 15 years to work down to the final winners from those initial crosses. And we do that by just simply trialing in as many different situations and environments as we can. This Venn diagram helps to illustrate this where the circle on the left here was associated with some drought tolerance screening at Texas A&M. University of Florida, Oklahoma State, University of Georgia, and NC State. And then the circle on the right half illustrates my efforts within the state of Florida to do many, many trials to make sure that we have good adaptability in this state. We then want to make selections of those that had good adaptability in Florida and good drought tolerance. We'll advance those lines. At some point, we'll begin to work with producers and then hopefully with a release and commercialization of a product. So commercialization in 2020, so the cross for Citrozoi occurred way back in 2008. So that was a 12 year process from beginning to end with a commercial product. And Citrozoi has been trialed uh, at 38 different locations across the US, so we do try to do everything we can to put these grasses in different environments. So now I'm going to show some uh, data from the uh, zoysia grass program here. 
uh, on some both fairway and putting green trials. And some of this uh, research efforts have been funded by Atlas Turf International, Sod Solutions, Modern Turf, and JW Sod. It's always important for me to mention those that are helping to support the research programs. Uh, we couldn't do what we do, and we wouldn't be able to provide new products for this industry if we didn't have the funding available to the research programs. And I meant to make this statement ahead of time. Everything we do in this breeding program is to improve the environmental sustainability of our industry. We wanna provide products that require fewer uh, or less fertilization, require fewer pesticides, meaning that they're more tolerant to diseases, more tolerant to insects. They have good drought responses, so less water is needed to maintain them. Again, it's an environmental approach to the breeding program. We don't put a lot of inputs into these trials. They're left lean in terms of fertilization. Uh, we don't use any fungicides or insecticides. Again, uh, they're kind of left to survive on their own. And so here's some data from the uh, zoysia grass fairway trial that we have. Again, this was established in 2019 from plugs and then uh, grown in through 2019 in the early part of 20. And so we have turf quality from the summer of 20 and turf quality from this recent winter from 2020 to 2021. And again, the same uh, rating scale was used here for rating. And the commercial cultivars included are Xeon and Citrozoi as a just recently named commercial cultivar. Um, <clears throat> the entries here are sorted based on their summer TQ ratings. So from left to right, we have the best on the left side of the graph to those that performed poorly on the right side of the graph. And again, uh, this kind of benchmark of a TQ value of six is uh, anything below that would be considered unacceptable. Anything above that would be considered acceptable. So there are lots of grasses here that have TQ values above six, particularly during the warmer months. And we're definitely outperforming the commercial cultivar Xeon. Again, Xeon was developed um, in Texas in a, or selected in Texas, a much uh, warmer, drier environment, and also a lot more DLI available in Texas than what we have in Florida. So based on the disease pressure that we have in the state, Xeon does suffer quite a bit, and we have several experimental lines uh, with improved disease resistance in, in our environment. Um, when it comes to golf, though, it, we really, there's a, even though er, everything in this trial is being mowed at a fairway height here, 13 millimeters, some of them aren't quite what I would call golf course worthy, at least for an upscale course. Some of these that have uh, suitable fine textures to really compete against Xeon, uh, 1727 is one of those, 1732, 1723. Um, there's another one, and 1722 is another one. These are the grasses that really have the, the most appropriate leaf texture to be competitive in the golf course market. And they, and they all are, are making the bar here for TQ, turf grass quality during the warmer months above six. And then many of them also have better quality in the cooler months compared to Xeon. So across the board, even though they may not be some of those that have the highest TQ ratings, this group of grasses, they've got what it takes to do well in golf course situations. <clears throat> and so these are the turf quality. And so now we can look at some of the disease assessments for this same group of grasses. And again, disease is visually rated where nine would be no disease and one is a dead plot from disease. And we have uh, bipolaris and dollar spot from, from September of 20, dollar spot from March of 21. And then recently, we've also again had both dollar spot and bipolaris occurring in this trial. So we have three bars here for each of the entries. And it is sorted, um, trying to remember how this is uh, 
top. This is sorted from left to right based on this April 21 rating that was a combined rating for buy Polaris and dollar spot. I thought I would sort it by that bar since that was uh, a recent disease event. Um, so you can see that there are uh, many experimental lines that are very uh, resistant to these diseases. And you see that um, Xeon is uh, rating around a five for all three of uh, these disease ratings. Again, uh, in our climate, Xeon I know is a, uh, is a good grass and used extensively around the world. But when it comes to the disease pressure in Florida, uh, Xeon is not the best choice to use. And we're going to have better things that come onto the market within a few years from this program. Uh, again, looking at the traffic tolerance of these grasses, and this, this is set up just like with the Bermuda grass. We have the percent green cover here on the y-axis and the dates of rating. So we have the four bars associated with each of these. And as you look at uh, some of these bars close up, remember there was that recovery period that we saw with the Bermuda grasses. You don't necessarily see that with the zoysia grasses although you don't see a big decline occurring. Um, there are a few where there is some recovery, but mostly they just kind of stayed steady in terms of their percent cover between uh, these two November ratings. And then of course we had the significant freezing events prior to the last rating on December 4th. Uh, but we have Xeon over here that uh, lost uh, had significant wear occurring on it and then lost uh, color due to the freezing temperatures and several experimental lines that are holding uh, green cover through this period of the year, uh, indicating better wear tolerance and also continuing to maintain that green cover even after those freeze events. One of the major goals of the Zoysia program is improved winter performance. Uh, and we do this uh, not only just for the golf uh, program, but in the landscape program as well, because our primary landscape species is St. Augustine grass, which doesn't really lose color in the winter in the state. So if your neighbor's got St. Augustine grass and you've got uh, zoysia grass and your zoysia grass goes brown dormant in the winter, then uh, you're not happy. And so again, some of the traits that we work on aren't, aren't always environmentally important, but they're important to the end consumer. And winter color is one of those that's really important to the end consumer and important for golf courses in the state with all of our play occurring in the winter months in Florida. Um, so that's it for the zoysia fairway. We've also got some zoysia grasses that we're evaluating for putting green performance. And again, this was established in 2019 and the mowing height here is 4.2 millimeters. And we have turf quality in 20 and turf quality up to the current point here for 2021. Uh, I didn't break this out into the winter because several of these grasses just simply didn't lose uh, color in the winter. They, because of the short mowing height, there's enough heat retention in the soil and the air doesn't, the cold air doesn't get down in the canopy and penetrate it. And so you don't see much loss of color. Uh, the commercial standards for comparison were diamond zoysia grass and laser zoysia grass. Diamond has been at least in the US market for more than 20 years, maybe 25 years. And laser is just getting into uh, the US market, a, a recent release from the Texas A&M program. And actually my program contributed to the release of laser. We did a lot of evaluation work and shared data back with Texas A&M. Um, in terms of appearance between diamond and laser, laser is much finer textured than diamond. And I don't expect you would have as much thatch accumulating with laser as you might with diamond. Um, but as you look at the experimental lines across here, there are three of these grasses in particular that I are doing well at my location. At other locations, we have a couple of other of these grasses that are also doing well. Um, but these grasses have done well through 2020 and then also 2021. 
and it's really these two that I'm most interested in. Uh, FZ1704 is, has the finest texture of any of the grasses in this group. Um, very small grass, could probably be mowed at very, very low mowing heights. We're going to start expanding some of these grasses so that we can do more with them in terms of their management and mowing heights. These plots over here are, uh, well, I should say there are three um, by, all right, let me take that back. I'm converting to uh, meters here. There are two by four meters, okay? And so they're not really big enough for us to do a lot of different management things on. So we're, we want to now take these winners and put them in bigger plots so that we can do more management, look at different mowing heights, maybe look at primo rates on these, do a better job of increasing the putting speeds, just do some more things with these grasses. Uh, and then we've also had some significant disease occurring on these through the winter. We get a lot of large patch. Large patch caused by Rhizoctonia solani is the worst disease that we have on zoysia grass in the United States and is a limiting factor for use of zoysia grass in Florida. And uh, you'll see that laser actually got quite a bit of large patch on it. And again, those two grasses that I'm most interested in 1726 and 1704 had the least large patch at both of these dates, December and January, than any of the other grasses in this test. So uh, these grasses just have the tremendous health. They don't seem to suffer from a lot of uh, these uh, diseases that occur. Um, they are they have been maintained uh, fairly well during this early stage. We're going to back way off the fertilizer this year and see what they look like when they ran a little bit more lean and again, increase plant plots with increased uh, sizes so that we can do more with the management of these grasses. And that's all I've got uh, today. So I, again, very much appreciate the opportunity to be here with you and happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. And this is my uh, email address. If you want to write that down real quickly and send me an email at some point, very happy to communicate with anybody. And thank you to the Asian uh, Golf Industry Federation for uh, putting this on. Well, Dr. Kevin, uh, thank you so much. I mean, for the very detailed and engaging presentation. And uh, I think uh, to date, you sort of oversupplied our audience because they don't have any questions yet. Maybe I'll wait for a few <laughs> minutes to see if they can get their brains in order. Um, you know, I'm going to ask you some general questions. Um, you know, you um, you mentioned that you've come to times before in, in Asia. Is there, you know, a lot of times local relevance and history is important, you know, obviously geographic and location is uh, in your experience and any plans, have you had any dialogue with the Koreans or the Japanese or in addition to the, to the Chinese for any sort of cooperative testing and, and, and work on this in this regard? Uh, I actually recently had a, a sod grower from China uh, visit the program this spring, and we discussed uh, the possibility of maybe trying to um, get some populations over in Asia so that they could actually be screened over there and we're not picking something developed right. intensively in the States and then just hoping that that applies to something halfway around the world. You know, the better approach would be to do some breeding over there in the vicinity so that it have, would have more regional relevance. Uh, there are a lot of, there are gonna be a lot of challenges to do that from uh, just a, a paperwork trail point of view and the, yeah. and the ownership of the material from the university perspective. Um, but one thing uh, with my group at the university that I work with on intellectual property, they're always very willing to try things. And so if somebody uh, has an interest in trying to do some things. We, you know, there, I, I mentioned that Tacoa was recently licensed to a producer over there in Vietnam. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and I know that the zoysia grasses from that have been developed in other areas of the U.S. have also been licensed for production over there. So that's one avenue, but 
you know, down the road, it'd be better to have a breeding program that's more regionally specific. Absolutely. It makes a difference. Um, we're involved in testing of, uh, but, uh, of a, a project where, where we're exchanging experimental material between Oklahoma State, University of Georgia, University of Florida, Texas A&M, and NC State. And, you know, I'm very close uh, geographically to the Tipton, Georgia program. And geographically, I'm well separated from the Oklahoma State Bermuda grass program. And when you bring a lot of entries from both of those programs to my location, you can almost draw a line in the sand in terms of which ones are going to automatically have better performance uh, as a group. You know, there, there will be a few winners from the Oklahoma State program uh, you know, there might be five or 10%, but there may be 80% from the Tipton program that look good. And that's all just because that breeding location is close to me. It makes a difference. So there's a lot of potential to, uh, to expand that sort of cooperation with Asian turf institutes and, and, and really localize the, the results. And it'll still yes. take some time. I mean, given the, the life cycle of your products, I mean, 12 years from development all the way to commercialization is a long time. Yeah, it would take someone yeah. who would be committed to the process and have right. to provide some funding throughout that process. So we have a question from Rob in Hong Kong. He says a big issue here is thatch management. What are you seeing regarding thatch in any of these varieties? Is there a way to even measure thatch properly? Sure, we can measure thatch. Uh, basically, uh, we, we burn it, we, we put it into a kiln and burn it off and measure uh, the carbon that results from that to get an, an accurate estimate of the carbon accumulation that was in that sample of tissue. Uh, thatch is a big deal in zoysia grass. Um, you can feel it even when you run across it with mowers if, if your thatch gets out of hand and the best ways I really try to educate end users in around here that I deal with to not push zoysia grass for color. Don't fertilize for color. When you do that, that's going to set you up for more thatch. That's going to then set you up for more diseases and more insect problems. Don't push for color. Monitor your growth. If you see a reduction in growth, then it's time or a reduction in clipping volume, then it's time to think about fertilization and then spoon feed it a little bit. Don't uh, put out large amounts of fer uh, fertilizer like you may be able to do with Bermuda grass. They're just very different species in their growth and how they utilize nitrogen. And so zoysia grass, everybody knows is a thatch accumulator. And if, if you're not managing that, through nitrogen rates and uh, frequency of application, then you're gonna have to obviously employ a dethatching program or a very frequent verticutting program or grooming uh, frequently. And, uh, you know, I worked for a long, uh, as part of my education in the Texas A&M program, worked with Milt Engelke in that program. And he did a lot of work at the utilization of very frequent grooming particularly with the short mowing heights to help eliminate thatch or delay the thatch from developing. And it works, the grass, if you don't do it often enough, then the grooming, grooming process leaves the little lines in the canopy and it would deter from the aesthetic value, it would deter from the functionality of the turf, particularly on putting greens. But if you do that routinely as part of a practice, then you don't see those lines forming in the in the turf so for instance if you're grooming once or twice a week then you're not going to see those lines uh, form in the turf and that can really manage the thatch and increase your green speeds and just improve the health of the grass as well thank you um I have another question so you don't see much difference uh, same from rob uh, you don't see much difference in thatch production between the different types of zoysia um, I guess more specific. Well, we haven't, uh, you know, uh, the matrellas are going to produce more thatch than the japonicas in terms of the species. We haven't done a lot of work uh, looking at the different uh, uh, cultivars of matrellas or different cultivars of japonicas. We've done some nutrient work um, and uh, looked at 
uh, the performance based on the nutrition of those, but we haven't done a lot on actual thatch measurements. At one time we tried to, we had a graduate student who was going to do that and the graduate student left. <laughs> that happens. Things happen. <laughs> right. Um, we didn't ask, we asked you for golf specific and I'm sure when we ask you about sports turf, it's a whole nother presentation. And you mentioned also parkland and other treatments, but do you have any quick conclusions on, you know, I, it's impossible to briefly, but uh, in your work, I mean, for instance, uh, in stadium work uh, that you're, you know, uh, that's one of the areas where I believe we differ from Asia. Um, zoysia grass and sports turf just aren't a thing in the United States. Uh, I've actually never seen a sports field that was planted in zoysia grass. I know they're out there and they exist. Um, uh, in, uh, particularly in Asia and where zoysia grass is native and, and receives a lot more use and attention, but they're few and far between in the U.S. Uh, I've never actually seen one. Doesn't mean, yeah. you know, I really think that, uh, you know, the issues there, they're wear tolerant, but if you do wear, then they're so slow to recovery and people are scared to, to take that risk to use them. They want that bounce back. And we just don't quite have that in the zoysia grasses. Well, I and think I actually, um, you know, yeah. uh, Eric, this is one of those things where I could learn from folks over there that have tremendous experience probably with zoysia grass in a sports field. Well, we'd love to get you over here. We discussed that. And yes, it is being used uh, in sports fields out here. So that's perhaps a, an avenue to discuss uh, with some of it. We'd be happy to make some introductions because, yeah, it, it is being used out here to great success. As and far as we and know. I'm sure successfully as well. Correct. Well, you know, we'd love to have you out here, doctor, uh, one of these days when travel resumes, as we discussed uh, before we got on the webinar. But we'd like to, to thank you for sharing some of your time and experience with our turfgrass managers out here in Asia. We really appreciate your expertise and, and taking the time. Well, again, it's been an honor for me and, and appreciate the invitation. Great. And uh, to all our, um, to, to the webinar attendees, thank you very much for taking the time uh, out of your busy schedules uh, to view the webinar. We will be posting this on, on YouTube. I will be sending a, uh, a follow-up with the doctor's email for follow-up questions. He's uh, graciously allowed us to present the presentation as well on YouTube so you can view it at that time. So with that, I'd like to close off. Uh, there are more webinars which are coming up uh, and uh, we, we owe a debt of gratitude to Dr. Kevin and his peers for sharing information. But uh, thank you very much. Have a good rest of the week and, and a great weekend. So long. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, doctor. Okay, cheers.